Tonight, we're on Parliament Hill, the scene of political drama, key testimony from key players in a controversy that has gripped this place. That is a fact, and facts are very stubborn things. The Prime Minister's former top aide contradicting the former Justice Minister on the SNC-Lavalin affair. What are you insinuating? I'm not insinuating anything, I'm saying You are flat insinuating, out. what are you I'm insinuating? I'm asking you who wrote that for Combative testimony from Ottawa's top bureaucrat denying undue pressure. And watching it all. It's a pretty serious situation and serious allegations. Voters just months before an election. I've had a, a few misgivings about uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, certainly the last month has not helped. At issue is here to break it all down. The claims, the conflicting accounts, and the big question, what happens now? This is The National. I'm here in the West Block in the foyer of the new House of Commons after another gripping day in Ottawa. There's no word yet from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, but his former principal secretary has spoken. Gerald Butts was at the heart of Jody Wilson-Raybould's account of the pressure she felt to shield SNC-Lavalin from a criminal trial. Butts' testimony today told a different tale. And David Cochran has the contradictions. Out of the back room into the spotlight to counter the testimony of his one-time political ally. What happened last fall is in fact very different from the version of events you heard last week. I experienced a consistent and sustained effort by many people within the government to seek to politically interfere. Wilson Raybould says the political interference came in 10 meetings and 10 phone calls from September to December. A level of contact but says is not excessive in a town where some issues lead to dozens of meetings in a single week. That's two meetings and two phone calls per month for the minister and her office on an issue that could cost a minimum of 9,000 jobs. He denies they were trying to change her mind. They just wanted her to keep an open one. All we ever asked the Attorney General to do was to consider a second opinion. The second opinion would come from a retired Supreme Court Justice. Wilson Raybould says this was pitched to her multiple times, even after she said no. In my view, the communications and efforts to change my mind on this matter should have stopped. In fact, I learned for the first time while watching the former Attorney General's testimony that she had made a final decision on the 16th of September. But says Wilson Raybould never told the Prime Minister in writing the matter was closed, never said she was being pressured or that people were acting improperly. If this was wrong, and wrong in the way it is alleged to have been wrong, why are we having this discussion now? and not in the middle of September, or October, or November, or December. If the matter was truly closed, but says there were no obvious signs, Wilson-Raybould still solicited meetings where SNC came up, including a December 5th dinner with him. Minister Wilson-Raybould solicited the meeting with me. She also raised the subject with me. I wanted to speak about a number of things, including up bringing up SNC and the barrage of people hounding me and my staff. She asked if I had a view on the file, and I said I understood our offices were working together on ideas. He said I needed to find a solution. We parted that meeting as friends and colleagues and exchanged personal text messages a couple of hours later. I wrote, nice to see you. She replied, nice to see you too. Thanks for the convo. Please say hello to the PM. Butts gave his side of another key meeting, this one on December 18th, between Butts, Wilson-Raybould's Chief of Staff Jessica Prince, and the Prime Minister's Chief Katie Telford, a meeting Prince detailed in text messages to her former boss. Jerry said, quote, Jess, there is no solution here that does not involve some interference, end quote. I have a very different recollection of that meeting, but... Um, you know, my basic point to Ms. Prince was that if getting advice from someone like Beverly McLaughlin constitutes political interference, then it must be your position that you can't have a conversation about this file. That second opinion was of such importance to the Prime Minister because the deferred prosecution agreement was brand new to Canadian law and thousands of SNC-Lavalin jobs could be affected. You wanted to be able to look employees 
uh, of the company, pensioners, the supply chain in the eye and say, we gave this a good hard look. And that was, uh, that was all that was motivating us. He saw it as normal interaction between the PMO and a key minister. Things seemed fine until an abrupt and sudden change. I firmly believe that nothing inappropriate occurred here and nothing inappropriate was alleged to have occurred until after the cabinet shuffle. A competing version of events put on the record. Everything I had to say, I've already said to committees. And left for Canadians to judge. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Okay, obviously we were watching a uh, gripping testimony today. How did Jerry Butts come across? Well, you know, Rosie, Jerry Butts can be a fiery and competitive guy, and there was some concern in liberal circles that that mm -hmm. Jerry Butts could show up at committee today. Instead, we saw this very calm, measured, and respectful appearance in which he laid out a competitive, competing interpretation of the facts for Canadians to judge. So he pushed back without personal attacks against yeah. Jody Wilson-Raybould. The exception sort of being that clip we played right at the end where he insinuated that none of this was a problem until she was being moved from the Ministry of Justice and the cabinet shuffle, suggesting this was more about sour grapes and things like the Shawcross doctrine. So that could provoke a reaction, but no reaction tonight from the Prime Minister's office. They're, they're tight-lipped tonight on what the reaction is to this, though we will hear from Justin Trudeau at length tomorrow, a 7.45 a.m. news conference here in Ottawa, where he's going to respond to the testimony and take questions at length about this entire issue. Okay, get to bed then. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Few are closer to Justin Trudeau than Gerald Butts. They go back decades. His resignation last month was a key moment in all of this. This was his account of why. I was put in the position where I had to ask my colleagues to fight another colleague over accusations a colleague was making. And I think that that put the Prime Minister in an impossible position, given the nature of our friendship. Now, Butt said he didn't want to force Trudeau to choose or even appear to choose between a minister and a friend. According to his testimony today, that friendship has had to adapt to the new realities of the SNC-Lavalin affair. Have you had discussions with the Prime Minister since you tendered your resignation? He called me uh, once to wish me well. Um, I will say, Ms. Wraith, this is the longest I've gone in 30 years without talking to the Prime Minister. As David noted, Butt said he received no sign that Wilson-Raybould was concerned about pressure until she was shuffled out of the justice portfolio. Salima Shivji has more on what we heard about a critical moment in this story, the shuffle. Please be seated. It was an unwanted cabinet shuffle, according to the Prime Minister's office, forced by Scott Bryson's unexpected departure. And it turned into a pivotal moment of discord. The January cabinet shuffle had absolutely nothing to do with SNC-Lavalin. Today, Gerald Butts gave his version of how Jody Wilson-Raybould lost the justice portfolio, leading to this I accusation. That I stated I believe the reason was because of the SNC matter. They denied this to be the case. But says the first hint of those feelings came from Jane Philpott when she was briefed on her impending move to head the Treasury Board. Surprise gave way to concern for Butts, who says he warned the Prime Minister that idea could spread. He had to factor into his thinking the possibility that the assertion she, would, she had made would be made publicly, however far-fetched it seemed. But according to Butts, the Prime Minister remained firm. He wanted a star minister in charge of Indigenous services, Wilson Raybould. Only it should have been clear she'd turn it down. Of the office of the BC Regional Chief. The portfolio would put her in charge of the Indian Act she'd spent much of her life opposing. I should have known that and had we had more time to think of the cabinet shuffle, I probably would have realized it. But says down, he then gave some key advice to Justin Trudeau. Don't give in. If you allow a minister to veto a cabinet shuffle by refusing to move, you soon won't be able to manage cabinet. The Prime Minister listened to his longtime advisor and still lose control he did. Both Wilson Raybould and Philpot are now gone from cabinet, leaving the government still struggling to rein in a crisis. Do you think that it was a mistake to move Miss Wilson Raybould? Had everybody um, on the team done what uh, the Prime Minister asked of them, then I think we would not be having this conversation today. His version of the shuffle suggesting it was what triggered Wilson-Raybould's concern about pressure. 
a charge the former attorney general may not be able to respond to. The committee hasn't yet decided whether she'll be back for more testimony. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, Jerry Butts was the main attraction today, but the Justice Committee also heard from two other players. One of them clearly tried the impatience of opposition MPs. Here's Katie Simpson with the bureaucrats. Canada's top public servant came ready to defend his reputation. I made no threats, veiled or otherwise, that the minister's decision would lead to consequences for her. Michael Wernick denied crucial elements of Jody Wilson-Raybould's story that cast him as a central figure in the alleged pressure campaign. You're quoted as saying, I think he is going to find a way, speaking about the Prime Minister, to get it done one way or the other. Did you say that? I don't words approximating that. I do not have an independent recollection of the event. I did not wear a wire, record the conversation, or take extemporaneous notes. So you wouldn't, notes. Have, you wouldn't have stuck in your mind words like that? Uh, that is not my recollection of the right. conversation. Then you You're asked about threatening the Attorney General. You're asked about treading on dangerous ground, and you tell our committee, well, I wasn't wearing a wire. Sorry, I don't remember. Mr. Wernick, that is not a credible answer. I did not threaten the Attorney General. But in you don't any remember. Way. You told us you don't I remember. I am telling you, you now, wire, so Mr. Angus, if you, you don't remember. If you want the answer. You finish the answer to the question. Mr. Mr. Clark. I have never raised partisan considerations. I reminded her repeatedly she was the final decision maker. I did not attempt to influence her decision. Wernick insists he did nothing inappropriate and that it was the former Attorney General's responsibility to keep an open mind on cutting SNC-Lavalin a deal since he says the case against prosecution was evolving. The tanking of the share price of the company, making it vulnerable to takeovers, and communications from the new Premier of Quebec and the Government of Quebec, uh, which changed the risk uh, calculus around a conviction or not conviction of the company. Wilson Raybould testified last week she'd made up her mind by September 16th not to grant the company a deferred prosecution agreement, a decision that was so set in stone her former deputy minister said today that Wilson Raybould issued an order to keep a report on the consequences of a conviction secret from the Privy Council office. Did you provide that report to the Privy Council office? No, I didn't. Why did you not provide that report to the Privy Council office? Because uh, because my, I knew my minister was not, you know, comfortable for us continuing those conversation, and I was instructed not to send it. That, of course, triggers the question, why did Jody Wilson-Raybould not want to share that report? We asked, and she responded with a statement citing the same confidentiality rules that outline what she can and can't say, Rosie. Okay, but you've been speaking to sources uh, close to the Prime Minister. What are they saying about that report? Uh, sources tell me that are close to the Prime Minister that from their perspective, that claim about the report is quite damning for Jody Wilson-Raybould. Uh, and they're hoping that all of today is actually a turning point for them in this saga. But you have to remember from the Prime Minister's office, they've done themselves no favours on this issue and on this affair uh, since there's been a lack of transparency, really, and the slow drip of information that's really been taking place. Okay, so given all that, what are they hoping to do to try and get past it now? What I was told is that the Prime Minister spent the bulk of his day alone watching the testimony, making calls and exchanging messages with members of caucus talking strategy. I'm also told by a source with direct knowledge of the situation uh, that the Prime Minister's office has really shored up support in cabinet. They're not expecting any more resignations and that a cabinet shuffle could come as early as next week. It's looking like the Prime Minister is likely going to have to bring someone new into cabinet, but nothing has been confirmed just yet. Okay, Katie Simpson on this in Ottawa beside me for once. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Conservative leader Andrew Sheehan issued a statement reacting to today's testimony. It reads in part, the bottom line is Justin Trudeau tried to subvert the rule of law to win elections and benefit his friends. Nothing Canadians heard today conflicts with that. I repeat my call for an RCMP investigation into this matter and for Mr. Trudeau to step down as prime minister. He is too consumed with damage control to continue to govern. That from Andrew Scheer. Well, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh spoke to reporters after Gerald Butt's testimony. Here's some of his reaction. He can come to this committee and say that there was nothing inappropriate at all, that he didn't know that Ms. wilson Rabel had taken a position. That is just ludicrous to suggest that. That is incredible testimony. Uh, when Ms. wilson Rebold repeatedly indicated to many people that she had made a decision, for Mr. Butts to come to this committee and say he just learned about that last week just defies all logic. 
just some of the opposition reaction to a day of testimonies. So has anything changed or is it still fundamentally a she said, he said story? At issue is back now for the second time this week with the analysis. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, Andrew Coyne is in Toronto, and Paul Wells is in Ottawa tonight. All right, I guess let's start at the obvious place with Jerry Butts' testimony, uh, someone we obviously don't hear from very often. This was sort of the other part of this story that we were all anticipating. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Do you think that he uh, set up a, a, a credible narrative on the other side uh, of Jody Wilson-Raybould? Well, he didn't deny very much. There were a couple of things where he said, I have no recollection or I, re I recall that conversation differently. Mostly it was just a variant on the same spin, which was, it wasn't pressure, or if it was pressure, it was just so she would get a second opinion. Uh, because she took, she didn't take long enough making her decision or because uh, this, this law is supposedly new or because there's fresh evidence or a number of different things were trotted out. But all of them kind of miss the point, which is it's not up to them to pass judgment. It's not up to them to say, well, she didn't take long enough. It's not up to them to press upon her a second opinion. It's entirely up to her. It's really, at first instance, up to the director of public prosecutions. And in rare and exceptional circumstances, the, the attorney general can overrule her with a written directive. It is nobody's business in the prime minister's office, from the prime minister on down, and yet they all made it their business. Okay, although, Chantal, one of the things that, that Butts said was that he didn't know until last week that Jody Wilson-Raybould had made a final decision, and his understanding was that this could continue to be debated until there was a criminal verdict. Yes, and we were treated uh, by senior civil servants after Butts to uh, variations on that team. I thought that... Uh, his mission was uh, to establish an alternative uh, narrative yeah. and to do so without looking like a bully uh, because he was taking on someone who's now considered as a, a, a kind of a political saint. And I thought he achieved as much as he could achieve. Uh, I don't think that uh, he's going to convince people who, who have already made up their minds, but I think he probably managed to uh, at least so some seas of reasonable doubts as to whether there was just one way to look at this uh, and not two ways. I don't think the story is played out, but uh, I think this was as far or as much good as he could do to the government's uh, side of the story. What do, you, what do you think, Paul? Did he do some, some good for the government's perspective here or, or not really change things at all? This was the best day that the that team Trudeau, as distinct from the government, because the government used to include people like Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott. This is the best day that, J that team Trudeau has had, because it is the first time anyone on team Trudeau has spoken in complete sentences in any detail um, and, uh, and was conspicuously uh, uh, full of courtesy to all involved. Um, and uh, um, he, he essentially had a different interpretation of the role of the public prosecutor, the role of the attorney general from Jody Wilson-Raybould. Um, he said that if Scott Bryson hadn't quit cabinet, she would still be attorney general. It is reasonable to conclude from his testimony that she would still be hearing about weekly from the prime minister or one of his emissaries asking whether she changed her mind yet and that that would never stop because in uh, Jerry Butts's mind, there, 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 it, it is not possible to have a final decision. Not just that she never made a final decision, yes. but no such thing is possible until the day of verdict is handed in, which is which is a novel idea to me. I've never heard something like that. Or, or until so, they so get the answer they want. Uh, oh, well, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, is, it is a fact of legal life, though, that even when a, pro a trial is started, it can stop abruptly because uh, the two sides have come to a, a, a Absolutely, deal. because a professional so, prosecutor makes yes. that call. Okay. But, but you can work from that the inference that you would think that it's not over until it's completely okay. over. Let, I'm not wanting to discuss no, legalities, <laughs> but uh, it is also possible to get from the testimony that this wasn't the biggest central preoccupation of the government. Uh, yes, he, he made, that, yes, yes she, she heard about it. Uh, I don't doubt that uh, there was a point of view in the PMO that was not the point of view that she had. But I'm not convinced that they woke up morning, noon and night thinking, let's call Jody to ask her to change her mind. Okay, and, and well, one of the points that, that, that Butts reiterated when saying that he didn't do anything wrong was the fact, and they've, they've done this before, but he, he did it in a very succinct way here, that, that Jody Wilson-Raybould uh, didn't communicate to him that, that she felt pressured and she didn't communicate it to the Prime Minister. I just want to play this clip and then I'll get you guys to respond. If this was wrong, and wrong in the way it is alleged to have been wrong, 
why are we having this discussion now and not in the middle of September or October or November or December? Andrew, what do you make of that argument? I find that the most mystifying part of his testimony. According to her testimony, she told the prime minister at the meeting on September 17th, she told the clerk, she told the finance minister, she told Butts himself on December 5th, she told the two PMO officials, Bouchard and Marquez, she had told everyone, A, I've made up my mind, B, this interference and in, in pressure is highly improper, please stop. Maybe she didn't say please. Uh, <laughs> so for him to say, maybe he can say, well, I don't recall her saying that to me, but he'd also have to say, the prime minister never told me, the people who report to me never told me, or maybe she made up all those quotes as well. But she, she, they made a big deal, Paul, of talking about how the number of meetings that she had, and, and she didn't even take all those 10 or 11 meetings that happened, was not uh, a large number compared to the way these things get deliberated. I don't know if that's something that resonates beyond this place or if it resonates at all. Um, I admit to being surprised at the notion that Justin Trudeau needs 10 meetings with a minister uh, to figure out what she thinks about something. Um, I, would, I would wonder how many meetings he had with Christian Freeland about the details of negotiating free trade with Europe, for instance. I'm given to understand that it wasn't, a, it, it, it wasn't 40, it wasn't three. Um, uh, this, this is a very hands-off prime minister whose uh, right hand is suddenly arguing that uh, there, there hasn't been a fulsome conversation until there's been more than once a week for four months. Look, if the Prime Minister of Canada was sending someone to talk to me once a week for four months, I would think that he was pretty preoccupied with what I was doing. Or maybe you would want you to run for him. <laughs> <laughs> so where does this where does this leave us at the end of the day? I mean, between what Butt said, which certainly was you know got more attention, and Wernick and the the deputy minister Duguay, where, where does that leave us now, Chantal? Well, you've got the prime minister tomorrow We're giving a news conference. Apparently, it's I guess an open-ended exercise time-wise, uh, and he is planning to take the time to answer questions before yeah. flying off somewhere. Uh, I would predict that the narrative you heard today has now become the narrative and you're not going to hear very many people stray from that narrative. We, except for this and that here and there, there wasn't much uh, light between uh, the clerk this afternoon or the deputy minister of justice and I f expect Justin Trudeau to stick very closely to uh, Jerry Butt's narrative. What do you think, Andrew? What, where does this go? Well, I'd like to see where it goes is in the committee, where we've now heard from Wernick twice. We've heard from Butts rebutting uh, Jody Wilson-Raybould on matters in which she was not allowed to speak, including. So are we going to hear back from her? Apparently not. Are we going to see the emails and texts between the principal players to validate this contention that nobody told Jerry Butts anything? Apparently not, according to the committee. Are we going to hear from Jane Philpott or any of these other officials uh, who have had something to say either according to Jody Wilson-Raybould or have said it publicly? Are we going to hear testimony from them? They're not in the witness list, yes. So it's all very well for the Prime Minister to have some kind of semi-contrition statement tomorrow. But what we'd like, to, I think what the public deserves to hear, uh, is some facts and some documents and some testimony from the players involved, uh, none of whom at this point are, the, the committee shows any signs of calling. Yeah, although Jody Wilson-Raybould did say today, I'm willing to go, come back, I'm willing to say more if they'll let me, I'm willing to you know, go beyond the waiver if they'll let me. So Paul, though, is the goal tomorrow and beyond this, it, I guess the hope would be that it just, what, goes away? Um, governments always help themselves when they present a case rather than refusing to present a case. Uh, today uh, was substantially better for Trudeau's case than the last month has been, and I, mm -hmm. I, I suspect he'll improve his case tomorrow. There's a lot of people who want to believe him, and uh, he, he's, he's giving them a chance to. But I don't think Andrew's going to get his wish. I think the committee is essentially going to shut down its um, proceedings pretty quickly. And in a month, this will be a few lines in campaign speeches where Justin Trudeau will say, look, I cared about 9,000 jobs. I don't know what these other people care about. The one thing that I was thinking is the remains is what to do with these two now MPs who remain in caucus. And that is the one sort of thing that could still get lit, I guess, if, if, if he has to make a decision somehow, Chantal. I uh, think that it would probably be very counterproductive for the prime minister to uh, not, he, what's the sentence? Keep your friends close and your enemies yes. closer uh, yes. to martyr uh, to leading or formerly leading uh, persons in this caucus by expelling them. I, I think he might as well just 
have them stay and try to uh, get some glory out of uh, entertaining a diversity of views. But I okay. don't know. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for being here twice this week. Chantal and Andrew, I will see you tomorrow. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast. Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. And as I said, At Issue, we'll be back tomorrow for what is our regular Thursday slot. And yes, there's a lot more coverage from Parliament Hill ahead. First, though, Ian, you are watching more developing news tonight. And Rosie, let's start with a personal and no doubt difficult message from Alex Trebek. This week, I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Now, normally, the prognosis for this is not very encouraging, but I'm going to fight this. The 78-year-old has hosted the popular game show since 1984 and is currently in his 35th season. The Sudbury-born Trebek started his career at the CBC and hosted other game shows in Canada and the United States, including Reach for the Top. Last year, he took a leave of absence from Jeopardy after undergoing brain surgery. In his message today, he vowed to keep on working, saying he still has three years left on his contract. Today we heard from the Venezuelan Foreign Ministry. American freelance journalist Cody Weddle has been released by the Venezuelan government. Military counterintelligence forces raided his home and he was taken to their headquarters where he was interrogated on espionage and treason charges. The Virginia native has worked in Caracas for four years, reporting for several media outlets, including the CBC. There are reports he was taken to the airport and is leaving the country this evening. Toronto Police Superintendent Ron Tavener has withdrawn his name to be Commissioner of the Ontario P Provincial Police. Tavener is a close friend of Premier Doug Ford, who appointed him to the position last year, but there was backlash and Tavener stayed in his old job. This announcement comes just two days after Ford fired the OPP's Deputy Commissioner, Brad Blair, who was critical of Tavener's appointment. And we have a lot more ahead tonight, including a go public investigation into a dangerous defect that's triggered a major vehicle recall. Plus, we get rare access inside Huawei's headquarters in China. First, though, we will be back from Parliament Hill with this. From the halls of power to the people who will soon exercise their power, the voters. I really had hoped for better from Trudeau. With an election just months away, what are they thinking? We set up our red chair in a bellwether riding. Canadians expect their government to look for ways to protect jobs. But were jobs really at risk? What are those 9,000 families going to do? Our senior investigative correspondent digs in next as the National continues from Westmont. So it was and is the Attorney General's decision to make. It would, however, be Canadians' decision to live with. Specifically, the 9,000 plus people who could lose their jobs, as well as the many thousands more who work on the company's supply chain. We heard that claim once again today as the Prime Minister's former top advisor gave his long-awaited testimony. If the engineering firm SNC-Lavalin is successfully prosecuted and then barred from federal contracts for 10 years, Canadians across the country will pay with their livelihoods. Well, Diana Swain, our senior investigative correspondent, looked into the jobs. 9,000 jobs on the line, says the government. But how realistic is that? This construction analyst suggests not very. I think that they're playing the worst case scenario but I don't necessarily think it is necessarily a likely scenario. That's because SNC-Lavalin is already involved in billions of dollars of projects in Canada that won't be finished for several years. It's also in the final phases of bidding for other large contracts, like refurbishing the Petulo Bridge in Vancouver. And those massive provincial projects would still be available to SNC, even if it's shut out of federal contracts. In other words, potentially lots of work still to be had in Canada for the company and its employees, even without a deferred prosecution deal. How do you walk away from that just because the federal government says, well, we're shutting the door to you for 10 years? Interestingly, in a recent conference call with shareholders, SNC's CEO, Neil Bruce, was asked how worried he was about losing access to federal work in Canada. We've got plenty of opportunities to grow the business uh, outside of Canada. 
Um, you know, but we're also committed. We're committed to the Canadian, you know, to the Canadian market. And the lack of a deal here isn't even the company's biggest problem right now, which introduces another intriguing political angle to the SNC story. In late January, it revealed to shareholders it had suffered an operating loss of $1.3 billion in 2018, compared to a profit the year before. It said its oil and gas business in Saudi Arabia in particular had been hurt in part because of difficult intergovernmental relations between Canada and Saudi Arabia. That's a reference to all that's happened since last summer when a tweet from Global Affairs Minister Christia Freeland infuriated the Saudi government. Relations haven't recovered. Neither has SNC-Lavalin's share price, which has fallen sharply in recent months. So, Diana, there's been this suggestion that SNC-Lavalin would have been so frustrated it would move its headquarters out of Quebec to somewhere like the UK, for instance. What are you hearing about that notion? Well, that's where its largest subsidiaries are based. In fact, it has more employees there right now than here. And one imagines the British government might offer all kinds of incentives to get it there. It could use the good news headlines. But would it make sense for a global company like SNC-Lavalin, which frequently works across borders, to go to a country that hasn't quite figured out what its future relationship will be with any country in the EU? Perhaps not. And it's previously committed to stay here until at least 2024 under a loan agreement. Which brings us back to the question of jobs. And asked today, none of those who testified in Ottawa could pinpoint exactly where this idea that 9,000 jobs could disappear even originated, though we've certainly all heard a lot about that idea in the past month. Another good question for the Prime Minister tomorrow. Diana, thanks for this. Thank you. The Liberals have taken a hit in the polls since this all began, while the opposition parties have gained some ground. And with an election now about seven months away, that matters, especially in ridings like Peterborough Kawartha, just northeast of Toronto. It's represented now by Liberal Cabinet Minister Mariam Monsef, but the area has flipped back and forth between Liberals and Conservatives for decades. So we took our red chair there today to see how voters are feeling now. We'll see, we'll see what the question is. Can I open it now? Given the events of the last month, what do I think of my Prime Minister? What do I think of my Prime Minister? Hmm. I would like to see him resign. So uh, I, I feel that if he can't get his own house in order, he doesn't have the uh, confidence of the country, and he certainly doesn't have my confidence that he can uh, run the government of Canada. I know what a lot of other people think of him. <laughs> they want him out. <laughs> I feel like he's in a tough spot, but he probably got himself in that mess. I think Justin Trudeau is the man for me in office, and I would vote for him again tomorrow if tomorrow were election day. I actually don't think that it's that uh, outrageous that the, uh, the, the, the government of the day is going to want to see a company like SNC-Lavalin uh, stay afloat and stay alive and employ people in, uh, in, in Quebec. In the last election, I voted for Trudeau. Uh, in any upcoming elections, I will definitely be rethinking that decision. What do I think of my Prime Minister? Damn, that's a doozy. Uh, in the last election I voted uh, Liberal because of Justin. Uh, I thought he'd be really good and uh, turns out you know, buying pipelines and uh, caving into big corporations is not really what I'm looking for in a prime minister. But uh, I think the uh, ex-attorney general might uh, be a good stand-in and uh, we should give her a chance. In the next election, I will not vote for our prime minister. I've always liked Prime Minister Trudeau. I'll give him a chance just like I give everybody else. 
In the last election, uh, I voted Conservative. I intend to vote the same way again, likely. As a voter, I feel like there really is never a good choice <laughs> as far as politicians go, um, but I really had hoped for better from Trudeau. Good, Ari. We're good? Okay. And if you weren't in Peterborough today, and I gather some of you weren't, you can still take a seat on the red chair. Share your take with us on Instagram, at CBC The National. We would, of course, love to hear from you there. We will hear from the Prime Minister. He's expected to talk about all of this tomorrow at 7.45 Eastern, CBC News Network and cbcnews.ca will, of course, have live coverage. And, yes, that's right, Ian, at issue, we'll be back again tomorrow night to break it all down. It won't be a regular thing, though, I promise. I don't know. It seems like it's every night, but it's been interesting <laughs> every night. We have some stuff coming up still on tonight's show as well. CBC's Asia correspondent gets rare access inside the walls of Huawei's headquarters. This campus here in Shenzhen has become the center of the storm. It's facing a controversy. It says it never expected legal and political challenges and accusations, it says, are simply unfounded. It was a brief court appearance today for Huawei's chief financial officer. Meng Wanzhou was arrested in December at Vancouver's airport at the request of U.S. authorities for allegedly violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. Her case has infuriated China, and her lawyers say they'll raise issues of abuse of process, privacy, and charter rights. She's also suing the RCMP and border services. Meng's next court date is May 8th. Huawei says Meng's arrest shows the tech giant is being unfairly targeted. It's on the offensive, defending its reputation and courting public opinion. Our Sasha Petrasek got a rare tour inside its headquarters. Take a train ride through Huawei's newest research base, as its employees do, and it's easy to get lost amid Bavarian castles and placid ponds, a fantasy world designed before the U.S. threat to destroy China's highest tech star. Huawei, from its idyllic home base here in southern China, now finds itself at the center of this storm, a controversy it says it didn't expect, fighting legal and political accusations it insists are unfounded. And opening doors to facilities that used to remain out of reporters' reach. In the past, a request from the CBC wouldn't have gotten us into the labs where new cooling systems are tested. Certainly not into the room full of servers where Huawei's cybersecurity team takes on hackers and promises to protect your privacy. We will have you over here. In a rare interview, senior vice president Catherine Chen says she doesn't understand the U.S. campaign to keep Huawei's leading 5G internet technology out of global networks. So why are they so afraid of you? <laughs> One U.S. fear is that somewhere in Huawei's production lines, it is building back doors to let the Chinese government snoop. And that Chinese law requires Huawei to pass along foreign secrets. Not so, says Chen. Still, among the high-tech companies revolving around China's digital capital, Shenzhen, Huawei plays the biggest role in China's growing nationalism. It's been honored by school children in a video that went viral. We're taught to love our motherland, they sing, just like we love our homegrown phone, Huawei. This is not a company ad. No wonder the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou in Canada struck a nerve here, especially among old friends like Chen at company headquarters. When she was arrested, were you surprised? Uh, 
，也更相信加拿大司法系统一定能够公开、透明、公平、公正的处理。That's a very different position from the Chinese government's, which has accused Ottawa of acting unfairly. But then Huawei still plans on doing business in Canada, sprinkling Canadian rooftops with its 5G antennas, just like here. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Shenzhen. And after Sasha's tour, Huawei announced that it's launched a lawsuit in the United States challenging the law that bans government agencies from buying Huawei equipment. Up next on The National, a B.C. family goes public with a terrifying ordeal. They were driving on a snowy highway when suddenly their engine failed. We felt that our lives were in danger. Uh, my eight-month-old was in the back seat. Um, we were passing a semi-trailer at the time. You know, we could have been seriously injured. A major car maker is recalling tens of thousands of vehicles across Canada and the United States. It's a move some safety advocates have long been calling for and one that a BC family wishes had happened earlier. Rosa Marcatelli with Go Public has the story. Ready? Danielle Collette cringes when she thinks about the moment her vehicle's engine failed at 120 kilometers an hour without warning on a snowy highway in BC. We felt that our lives were in danger. Um, my eight month old was in the back seat. Um, we were passing a semi trailer at the time. You know, we could have been seriously injured. What the couple didn't know at the time is Hyundai and its sister company Kia had already recalled millions of vehicles with the same or similar engines. Over fears a high speed stall could cause a crash or the engines could burst into flames. The couple didn't know because their vehicle, a 2012 Hyundai Tucson, wasn't included in any of the recalls. I was quite surprised that they would only recall um, some of these engines. Safety watchdogs are blasting the car makers for taking too long to act. The recalls for what are called Theta 2 engines started almost four years ago. We're looking at some several millions of vehicles, both in the United States and Canada, that uh, we believe are at risk of catching on fire. 300 engine fires have been reported in the U.S. in less than a year. Transport Canada says three have been reported here. A mechanical inspection of the Vancouver couple's vehicle found the rod bearings had failed. The exact same issue identified in other vehicles that were covered in the recalls. But Hyundai told them they would have to pay the $8,000 cost of replacing the engine, more than the vehicle's worth. When the couple complained to Transport Canada, it told them it's investigating the recalls. I think part of the reason why Hyundai uh, dragged their feet was they didn't want to have to pay for all of those engines. Hyundai Canada responded to Go Public's specific questions with a general statement, saying it's working closely with Transport Canada to share information and to identify how to best ensure the safety of our customers as quickly as possible. Kia Canada also says it continues to work cooperatively with Transport Canada and will address any issues or findings as they arise. They need to come clean with their consumers, exactly. You know, how risky is this? Do they have a solution? Hyundai just issued its latest recall involving these engines. More than 30,000 vehicles in Canada, 500,000 in the U.S. And I'm hoping that they take this seriously. It's unclear if the couple will be covered under the latest recall. But after Go Public contacted the dealership, the couple was told the cost of the engine repair would be covered no matter what. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. And a reminder, the Go Public team gets its stories from you. And so if you have a tip, get in touch. You can send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. We will be right back after the break with The Moment. The Great Canadian Baking Show is coming back to CBC, and we're looking for Canada's best amateur bakers. Apply now. Go to cbc.ca slash greatcanadianbakingshow to enter. Hi, I'm Sarah McLaughlin, host of the 2019 Juno Awards. Join me as we celebrate the biggest night in Canadian music. The Junos, March 17th on CBC. Alex Trebek has hosted more than 7,000 episodes of Jeopardy over 35 years. So maybe it's only natural that when he had tough news to share with his audience, he stepped in front of the camera to do it. He announced he has stage four pancreatic cancer and pointed out that that does not come with a very good prognosis. 
He shared the difficult news with honesty and even humor. And that's our moment. Hi, everyone. I have some news to share with all of you, and it's in keeping with my longtime policy of being open and transparent with our Jeopardy fan base. I also wanted to prevent you from reading or hearing some overblown or inaccurate reports regarding my health. So therefore, I wanted to be the one to pass along this information. Now, just like 50,000 other people in the United States each year, this week, I was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Now, normally, the prognosis for this is not very encouraging, but I'm going to fight this, and I'm going to keep working, and with the love and support of my family and friends, and with the help of your prayers also, I plan to beat the low survival rate statistics for this disease. Truth told, I have to, because under the terms of my contract, I have to host Jeopardy for three more years. So help me, keep the faith, and we'll win. We'll get it done. Thank you. Well, that's a pretty positive outlook and someone that I grew up watching and so many people are very attached to. Yeah, he feels like an old friend, right? He's been part of our lives for so long. And of course, we all wish him the best. That is The National for March the 6th. Good night. Good night.